I'm a Pommy, this is a podcast, welcome to the show, our venue sponsors tonight, just a big shout out to those guys, uh, the London Hotel in Paddington in Sydney, um, Wednesday nights, dark night, $15 pictures, make sure you come down on a Wednesday night, also if you're looking to refinance your home loan, if you're looking to draw out some equity or get a pre-approval, get in touch with rossthemortgagebroker.com or Ross at Strategic Broker. Boop. Dot com dot au. <laughs> Our guest tonight, Mr. Hong Choi, Director of Strategic Broker, um, property investor and all-round hands in many pies, I would say. Yeah, that's I'm, right. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to start off with a quote, because we're going to go heavy and hard to begin with for the start of your life. Yeah, fair enough. And upbringing. Uh, from 1975 to 1979, through execution, starvation disease and forced labor the Khmer Rouge systematically killed two million Cambodians and almost one quarter of the country's population do you ever wonder what your life would have been like had your parents stayed in Cambodia yeah that, tough question I think um we look back and wonder I guess <clears throat> you know what if what could have been yeah. you know um I think everything you lived through or you've been through makes you who you are today and, you know, it wasn't for growing up in the Western suburbs or, you know, going through all the things that we went through. Uh, mate, life in Cambodia would have been a very different thing, you know. Yeah. Apparently my family was actually, they were pretty smart and quite wealthy when they were there until obviously, you know, during those periods of the Khmer Rouge where uh, they had to forfeit all of their land, all yeah. of their belongings. Yeah. Um, then my dad was forced to the rice fields to work 16 hours a day with one bowl of, uh, they call it congee or congee, slop. Yeah. You know, in other words, jail food. Uh, yeah. It's just a bowl of rice with a few veggies. And so people just died from mal malnourishment pretty much. So um, <laughs> my life there would have been completely different, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, after, the, I guess, the Khmer Rouge, um, you know, ended and, you know, Cambodia was still <laughs> trying to find its feet and they still, till today, are still left scarred trying to find their feet, right? Yeah, yeah. They've never quite recovered from it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think life would be really tough. Like I watched my cousins who I guess were there or still there um, and it's taken a very long time to actually get educated and like we had to send money back to obviously get them through what they needed to do yeah um, but yeah not, I, I don't think my life would be the way it is today for yeah, sure yeah, yeah so talk to me about the story of your parents deciding obviously you weren't born in Cambodia yeah you were born in a prison right I was, I was born in a refugee <coughs> camp yeah the so refugee camp. We were, I was born in um, in Thailand in 1987 um, we were six months old before we came to Australia um, but prior to the refugee camp, I think my family was in there for two or three years. Yeah. Uh, I think my dad tried to flee in 1980. I can't remember the exact year, but I think it's 1985. He, you know, they were trying to flee from Cambodia to find a better life, basically. So they jumped on one of those refugee ships where they fill yeah. up a few hundred people on a boat that could probably only handle about 30. Yeah. Um, and they put them out to sea to try to make their way to the Australian shores. Um, so that was the first time he tried to escape, packed everything up. Um, tried to flee in 1985 and they were caught by the Thai military along trying to get to Australia. You had to stop by Thai waters. Yeah. Um, so I think it was the, the Thai Marines, I assume. They yeah, yeah. They, they caught this um, refugee boat. They brought them in. They didn't know what to do with them. They're like, our prisons are full. You know, we can't be bothered you know, dealing with these people, feeding them, yeah, clothing so what them. Do we, what do we do with so, them? Yeah, they're, so in the middle of the night, they, they dragged their boat 20 kilometers out into the middle of the ocean, pierced holes in the boat and pissed off and, and left them there Fuck. yeah so pretty pretty rough because what happened after that was <clears> obviously the boat was sinking so they it was it's like like a movie like castaway yeah, or whatever yeah, you know yeah. like it's it's trying to get the water out yeah trying <clears> to get the water out no rain no water no food left so they started having to use like sheets just to catch water from the rain um and they managed to survive no food i think for four days or five days and just catching water uh, they're on the on the brink of death, most of them, and that was my whole generation was on that boat. So every single member of my family, the bloodline would have been gone. Was on that boat. Yeah, yeah. was on that boat the first time in '85. Um, they managed to somehow just let themselves float, and they got closer and closer, and they managed to get crash into a brick like a rock wall, which yeah. they were left swaying there for about a whole day. They said they couldn't, they didn't have enough energy, or like imagine like trying to climb a cliff face 
With no you know, energy. Yeah. yeah, with no energy. And they couldn't figure out. And they were just fortunate enough that they figured out a way to get off, land on the island, eat papaya and whatever veggies they could find. Where did they, where did they land? Where was it? Funny where? enough, they ended up back at a Cambodian island. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> so they, they started off in Cambodia, ended up back up in a Cambodian island. Yeah. Yeah. And um, they, they starved there as well for another five, six, seven days. Uh, well, they were not technically starved, they ate whatever they could find. They, what they could find. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. they, which they, yeah. they survived. And then a Vietnamese fishing boat um, came by and they waved them down. Um, and these were really nice people, the fishermen. They actually brought them on, you know, and then they brought them back to their community and fed them with their families, clothed in, them. In Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. So they took them back to their place in Vietnam. Uh, but then the Vietnamese authorities came. They like the people, the villagers were scared because these guys couldn't speak the language. They didn't know what, mm. you know, where they're from. Yeah. You know, are they going to rob us? You know, yeah. um, what are they going to do? Because they look, you know, they're shriveled. And, yeah, you, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you could imagine you're, you're, you're protecting your own family, right? And then yeah. they called the police. Police came, chained them up. And my dad described it was like those fixed steel rusted chains and yeah, they yeah. chained them all up and put them into um into jail and they were just stuck in chains for a month in the vietnamese jail after that and so the whole generation was stuck in a jail in vietnam as refugees escaping from cambodia Fuck. and yeah then i think my, from i don't know the like correct details of the story but from what my dad told me he said that the actual like he had a they had still had their belongings. He had a bar of gold, and right, he okay. bribed. He made really close friends with one of the prison guards, and he gave the guy a bar of gold and goes, "Look after your family, but can you help us get out one night?" And the guy, you know, I don't know what he'd done, but he managed to let them escape, and they fled and went back to Cambodia. Unbelievable. And then they obviously just put up um, being in Cambodia for then another two years until nineteen. Oh no, it was this I'm going way back actually. So this is like eighty five is the wrong year. They're going. I'm going back like. It would have been like 82, 83 or something like that. Yeah. Because they went back and then they went for two years and then they fled again in 85. So yeah. that's what happened the yeah. second time. Okay, okay. But the first time was that really nasty So that first event. time was pretty like rough. That was like, they should have all died. You know? Yeah, they yeah. should have died. Yeah, yeah. Nobody On should several have occasions probably yeah. throughout that. Many, many occasions. <laughs> <laughs> they somehow made it back and then... Um, they, my dad said we're gonna do it again. <laughs> Every, your mum was well happy about that. Right, no, nobody went with him this time. So the whole generation, his, his sisters, no one went with him. They're like, no, nah. they were all traumatized. Um, yeah, yeah. My dad still managed to find the courage to to push and do it again. And yeah. guess what? They got caught by the Thai military. <laughs> I was like, he wasn't very on. good at escaping, was nah. he? He didn't learn from his first lesson. Like. Nah, let's just jump on a boat again and uh, yeah, hope for the yeah. best and ended up yeah. in the same place. But fortunate enough, this time people, I guess humanity kicked in a bit more. Instead of taking them and sinking their boat in the middle of the night, they yeah. took them to the refugee camp. Okay. Um, and, you know, they arrested them, put them in a refugee camp and then, you know, um, I guess they had to live there until they figured out what to do with them. They yeah. couldn't have sent them back to Cambodia because they were going to pretty much, you know, I don't know what will happen to them if they went back. Yeah. Um, but then I was born there. So, you know, they maybe I'm the lucky child. They gave yeah. birth to me. So I think Bob Hawke was in power at the time. You know, good old Bob Hawke. Yeah. And he was, you know, he was all about immigration. You know, bring him in. Let's, let's get the country going. You know, our yeah. economy needs it. Yeah. Um, so then we were invited into the country under sponsorship. And oh, um, wow. because women and children were first. He could have just waited a few years and yeah. waited for the sponsorship to start. No, 100%. <laughs> he just, you know, why, why do you do all that for? Yeah. <laughs> oh, but I think they're doing it for refugees. So, yeah, like, you know, why, it all kind of paid off in some sense. They wouldn't have just grabbed you and given you a visa if yeah, you were in yeah. Cambodia, right? Because they were in no man's land with yeah. no i guess country to just call home so. so he got sponsorship well got all you guys sponsorship into australia yeah um how old were you at this point six months so you so. were six months your older brother lee would have been oh yeah he would have been uh five or six yeah you know so he, so actually, he would have seen a lot he actually of remembers it so yeah. i asked him about it and he goes man i don't actually don't he goes refugee camp wasn't a bad <laughs> <laughs> he goes all you it's do like quarantine right it's like you go out and play soccer with all the kids all day you know yeah, like yeah. imagine like think about childhood and playing with other kids all day even if you're yeah. sleeping in you know makeshift houses and you know yeah. for, for you as a kid you don't know any different you don't know any different yeah. Yeah. it's not like you've been polished and then you know yeah. now you gotta live in the crappers and you go oh, mm. like this is terrible <clears> you know <throat> like for them it's just whatever it's a little bit dirty but you know what we get to play with our friends every day yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. he didn't mind it but the parents obviously they didn't like they don't know any better either they worked on rice fields for 16 hours a day um, and yeah. you know were fed nothing and every time they tried to get food for themselves they, they witnessed friends being killed or hung or 
or crazy things that they used to see back in the days. It's a bit like North Korea, it sounds like. Yeah, or it, it was worse, yeah, worse for sure it was worse because they were killing their own people, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 No. yeah. So that's, the, that's, I guess, the journey to get to Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, where, yeah. so obviously your dad came over. What did, he, what did he do when he got to Australia? Where did you end up like living? What was the... Yeah, we ended up... Um, I think we got a... <clears throat> we got the stay of our aunties or my auntie's place because that's how the sponsorship rolled. Somebody from Australia had to sponsor oh, you. Oh, yeah, and, of course, yeah. Yeah, so we had a relative yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, and we stayed in their place for... Oh, I can't remember how long it was or I don't even know, but I think mm. it was might have been a year or two yeah. until my dad could find a job, get on his feet. But before yeah. that, he was just helping any odd tasks he could do, you know, to help yeah. you know, pick up a little bit of money here and there, yeah, yeah. Uh, which meant like sewing or... You know, a lot of Asians sewed back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. So what would happen is they'll just dump tons of like clothes that need like, fixing, for, like up. fixing up or stitching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you'd just be sitting there. Because I remember doing it myself. <laughs> I was like sitting in the house with mountains of sewing and parents yeah, yeah, yeah. used to be like, uh, you got to help out. So we're just sitting there sewing for like yeah, six hours right. in a day. You know, so <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that. I remember every day doing it. I used to hate it. Oh, my, what do all this crap? <laughs> I learned to sew when I was 18, when I joined the Marines. Yeah. They gave you a little sewing kit just in case your buttons fell off and you, stuff you, like that when you're on. You keep busting your buttons, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Eating too much. Yeah. Um, but what? Do you, how did you find, um, uh, obviously you settled and you obviously got a good life now in Australia, but how did you find uh, growing up and school and all that? Did you sort of settle into Australian lifestyle immediately? Or? Yeah, well, I was, um, for me it was You're different. Yeah, yeah, I'm an yeah. Aussie. I yeah, think yeah. my brother took a bit of time. Um, yeah. For me it was, it was mm. natural, mm. Um, but my brother adapted pretty quickly. Mm. I, I think because I was six months, I'm pretty much Aussie, right? Yeah, so yeah. there was no kind of, you know, any memory prior to it. I think yeah. it was the, uh, I just remember growing up but in... We had a two-bedroom apartment in Fairfield. Yeah. yeah, that's where we grew up. And um, yeah, it was a tiny little place, but, yeah. you know, we made the most of it and it was home. It was nice, yeah, that's good. you know. Um, but I, think, I remember before that staying at the cousin's place and there was a lot of us. They had five kids, two adults. The house was technically a three-bedroom house, right? Yeah, chaos. Yeah, and we, we, <laughs> we done like makeshift non-DA approved like extensions everywhere, <laughs> turned it into like, you know, a 15-bedroom, you know, yeah, <laughs> little yeah. cubicles everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of spent a lot of time there and then it went to our own place. My dad got a job at Sydney Water making middle tubes. Yeah. Worked there for 20 years. So Yeah, for, yeah it was there good. for a long time. Actually, longer than that, yeah. yeah. So obviously... Uh, family's doing okay you've settled into australia nicely mm. um how did you how did you go through like school and did you go to college and things like that or did yeah so i think <clears throat> after that was um you know i went to primary school mm. um in an area called wakeley which you know the area was actually okay we ended up buying a house there my dad yeah. worked and, and bought his first house there yeah um and then we went to i went to school in wakeley um had a few life events um, that happened around when I was in year three. And then I ended up having to move from Wakeley to St. John's Park, which is like the next suburb. But, what do you mean by life events? Um, well, my, my mother passed away when yeah. I was in year three. Yeah, and yeah. then after that, we you know we needed a clean start. So dad decided it was in the best interest to take me out of a school, which I was actually a top performer. Yeah, yeah. In move the, you to a new school. Yeah, in opportunity class. Um, I was in like, I was coming first in all the all subjects, fastest quiz kid, everything. Yeah. yeah. But I was I was a real geek. Like I had no social skills. Yeah, I was okay. actually really socially awkward. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. couldn't talk to people. You were that guy in the top set that would just bang out a yeah, test yeah. paper in twenty that, minutes. That was and me. Everyone's sitting there going, "What the fuck are we doing?" That was me, one hundred percent. They put me up, and then they moved me to this other school. Uh, and I remember when we went to another school. Uh, they didn't know where to place me because they didn't know how I resulted versus the yeah. previous school, yeah, yeah. life trauma, whatever it was, and then ended up putting me in the middle class where I met all the naughty kids. And <laughs> <laughs> I just remember the first day at that school was um, a couple of kids, you know, oh, you want to be my friend, you know, kind of, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. still know them nowadays, you know, but a lot of naughty kids put it out. <laughs> and, yeah, then, yeah. and then they put a quiz out and it was like, you know, expected to be a 15 minute quiz or something. I banged it out in like 45 seconds and I was like, put your hand up when you finished. I'm, like, I'm done. And the, and the teacher's looking at me like, is this kid in middle set? No. <laughs> Are you sure you've done all 20 questions? <laughs> yeah. And then I'm like, yeah. yeah. And they're like, let me check him. I got 100% on it or something like that. Like, okay, this kid doesn't belong here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. we need to move him up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was, you know, changing schools. Um, ended up, you know, going through public school sector around there. Um, yeah. But where we grew up, there was a lot of housing commission near us. So it was, 
it was relatively rough. You get you know, a mixed bag of kids. Yeah. So you get the naughty kids, the good kids, you know, a bit of all everything. sorts of upbringings and backgrounds. And yeah. yeah, I used to end up, I end up somehow gravitating to the naughty kids. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know how, but you know, they were a lot more fun back then. Put yeah, riding push exactly. bikes, you know, doing yeah. doing silly stuff around the streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, lighting up firecrackers everywhere. <laughs> that was childhood for me. I had a lot of fun. That was me. I was like in, in between the naughty kids and the ac- I wanted to be. I wanted to try and be one of the academics, basically. Yeah. But, but wasn't very good at it. So I used to copy the lad next to me all the time. Like yeah. he'd be the guy doing the 20 minute, like the two hour paper in 20 minutes and getting an A star. And I'd just be sitting there going, just just, just keep that page open for me, mate. So I can just flip no, through these. <laughs> that's that's the, yeah, the, the, I guess, work smarter, not harder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get the philosophy, same result. <laughs> philosophy nowadays. Um, yeah. So like, obviously, obviously school went okay. Like so, so, like obviously, social wise, it was absolutely fine. Obviously, you were mixing with all sorts of different types of people, but you were handling your own. Um, what happened after school? Because I know you managed to get into poker. Yeah, afterwards. yeah. So I think like, well, high school was a bit of a blur. I guess you know, I was always the smart kid, but hung around naughty kids. So yeah, jigged school a lot, and you know, obviously yeah, yeah, yeah. skipped a lot of days. So you know, came HSC. I done okay. I ended up like with a decent mark. Um, I got into accounting and finance at Macquarie Uni, yeah. uh, so that was my major. Um, went to uni and absolutely hated every living hour of uni. Yeah. I don't know, everyone, everyone has their own thing, but uni just wasn't my thing. You know, yeah, I felt yeah, like yeah. the things I was learning went relative to what I was trying what to achieve. To do, yeah. yeah, I just kept feeling like this is just stuff that I don't want to do, and just you know, I end up spending two and a half years there. I've probably got two subjects left on my degree. <laughs> And I still uh, haven't turned back to go back to it. But yeah, so I ended up, when I was 18, I needed to find a way to make money. Yeah. I ended up, um, one day my friend took me to a pub to run, uh, to play poker. Yep. And I'd learned how to play poker like only a week before at a friend's party. And I was like, oh, it's so fun. I was always good at card and mathematics. I was always yeah, good at card games, yeah. even when I was a kid. So Your I was like, man. yeah, that's it. <laughs> Absolutely loved it. Got in there, played my first tournament. I was I fell in love with it, and they kept going. It was free tournaments in the pubs, right? Um, the pubs make their money from bringing guests in. They yeah. charge ten dollars per player when people go into there. Yeah, and drinks uh, and, and stuff drinks like that. and yeah. pokies and yeah, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. So you know, it made it, was, it made sense for them to host it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so played a few games there, and then I sort of had a big sign up one time. It was like, oh, we're, we're you know that big American, we want you. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to recruit me into, we need you. into the poker tournaments. So I was like, oh, mate, that's calling me. I was working at McDonald's before that, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was like, you know, going from McDonald's at my... Mate, remember, becoming a McDonald's franchise owner wouldn't have been about oh, right, that, to be fair. I know a couple of them nowadays <laughs> and uh, they're not doing too bad. Yeah. I know I know a bloke with about 10 of them and he, yeah, uh, yeah. He, he's the guy who got the $4 million bloody Mercedes. There's only one of one in Australia. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. he's got one of them. Yeah, so I'm yeah. like, I'm assuming I mean, McDonald's franchise is doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that was, um, so we got um, from, I guess, f- from uni, I was spending obviously all that time. When I was 18, I was trying to find a way to make more money. Before that, I was running under, under 18's nightclubs with a friend for a little bit. Yeah. And then we made some co- coin there. Um, and then I always had this entrepreneurial mindset, always the kid that went, ran to the mailbox looking at the real estate, like, papers to see what's on for sale and you know yeah. the trading posts and see what we can buy and trade up yeah, I used to yeah. buy and sell things um off the internet or the internet just started coming in but before that yeah. um it used to be you know through trading posts and stuff like that yeah, so i used to do the same when yeah. ebay came out i was like this is the best thing on the planet because oh, i yeah. can just sell shit that i like i don't want or my parents don't want or my friends don't want or whatever and i can stick it on ebay make a few quid someone's going to want to pay 50p for it or a pound yeah. or whatever and at the time i had time on my hands <clears throat> it oh, got mate. to the point of it was making like 800 quid a month or something it was like 1500 bucks yeah in ebay it was like pff, it's it's the best thing no brainer. It's, <clears throat> it's almost like arbitraging sometimes you just find, yeah. you even buy stuff lower and sell it higher right yeah exactly it's just part of the marketplace yeah yeah having that mindset i guess young then you know when when did the poker tournaments i just remember the first conversation actually funny enough was um the guy who ended up becoming my business partner mm. in running poker tournaments um as a franchise uh, he hired me and he, I remember him saying, oh, like, we had done the interviews, like, oh, great, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, when when can you start? So, which pretty much means you got the job. Yeah. And I was like, oh, before we start, how much do we get paid? Yeah, and yeah. And he was like, oh, well, your pay is about $150 and your shifts are about four hours. And I was doing my maths. I'm like, oh, I'm on $9 an hour at Macca's. Yeah, this works. And I'm, yeah, like, I'm going to go do this. Like, wait a second. <laughs> this is a whole lot of more money than, yeah, yeah, than yeah. I was ever earning. So, like, that was the first time I ever had a lick of earning money. So, yeah. I started, like, earning 
like this you when know, you're 18 yeah correct yeah, yeah, yeah. earning yeah. money that was come i could you know do something with do something with. yeah so i was like making you know was average it out like almost 40 bucks an hour right so and then i just like put my hand up for every shift i was on double shift double shift double shift double shift so i was doing anything as much as like 12 13 14 15 shifts a week yeah you know so i was taking up every single shift i'd work seven days a week for a whole year uh saved every single cent and i, I just didn't know what i was trying to save up for but i knew yeah, i wanted my own business to do it, yeah, yeah, yeah well yeah. i was still doing uni full time so i was don't know how I scraped through I was uni, but I didn't even finish it, obviously, but I got through, you know, a ridiculous amount of um, subjects yeah. at the same time as doing this. I barely passed most of them, but I managed to make it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was like a whole, you know, that was a big hustle in itself. And where were you running these tournaments? Where were you doing? I had a, well, so originally I was working for someone in Southwest Sydney. That's, yeah. you know, Cabramatta, Fairfield, that kind of area. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, that, I worked for them for a year. I saved, I saved a lot of money in that year. Um, and then the opportunity came that one of the franchises went for sale in the inner west um, and I was like oh it's for sale so I didn't have enough money to do it by myself so I was trying to hunt a business partner yep. so guess what the guy that hired me it, was, it turned out it? that he was trying to get it as well so we are oh, both putting okay. resumes in to get it and then we're like somebody just goes why don't you guys just partner up yeah. And then we looked at each other and like, that's a good idea. That's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> so we partnered up. We didn't, no looking back, we ended up turning that franchise from like a 50th franchise to number two in the country. Never yeah. quite got that number one spot. My old boss had the number one spot. Yeah. Tried, tried to take as much as we could, but couldn't we just, we couldn't get it. But being number two and yeah, we're making a lot of money, I was probably making, you know, at one point, I think the peak of it, we had almost 20 staff, right? So you put that in comparison as an 18 or 19 at that time, 19 year old, you know, making six, six digits plus some, um, you know, I was having a pretty good, you know, yeah, good. Time, pretty good time at 19, <clears throat> buying drinks at the bar, having, you know, sh I used to be the guy I'd go to the bar at 19, buying everyone shots. Buying everyone shots. Yeah, yeah. we go free to out of a tray. Like, I'll be coming out of the tray. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> like, no. Yeah. And then you know what's funny? Like we talk about this as like, it's just a fun time and why'd you waste your money? And people go like, why do you waste your money on drinks? Yeah. The truth is all the people I've met through that period, right? They're now customers of ours. Yeah, yeah. Not all of them, but like the good ones who- A lot of them, yeah. Yeah, a lot of them, they, they've, they know you as a person and they know that, you yeah. know, you're generous, you're caring, you yeah. know, you actually, you know, you actually want people to enjoy themselves or have a good time or mm. you know make um you know, make better for their life well, so. i don't i don't think anyone really unless they've got you know an upbringing with parents that are like super strict are that good at their finances between the ages of 18 i don't know yeah. anyone between the age of 18 and 24 probably that's any good really at their finances no 100 I, I was a solid yeah. saver between the spending but so i was always mm. like i yeah, knew there was put your bit away and then you spend after yeah i would I'd never mm. spend more than like i think it was like on average I calculated at one point just for fun I don't know why but I would never spend more than 40% of my income so yeah. I've always I, like which you know sounds it's pretty good like if you can save 60% right but I was yeah, earning yeah. a lot of money too at the yeah. time so yeah, yeah. the 60 you know, I could spend quite lavishly and still you know put away a bit of money so it was so did you have um going through these poker tournaments did you did you jump in on some of these games yourself or were you oh, I used to play heaps yeah play all the time that first year and while I was working for the other franchise I somewhat consider myself playing professionally so part of the money to buy the business I actually won the money or most of the money pretty much yeah, yeah, yeah. on top of the savings of course but yeah you know you work and then you spend but you know to make the extra money for, for to you know, I needed six digits to get in, right? Yeah. So get to six digit savings, like it was, you know, to between the age of 18 and 19. That's a lot of money. It's yeah. a lot of money, yeah. <laughs> and I, I hustled my way through, sat at the casino for like mm. 12, 13 hours a, a session. And uh, we just we do a thing called fishing. So you sit there and look for the fish. So if you can't spot the fish on the table, they say you're the fish yourself, right? So yeah, okay. You yeah. normally go on the lower end tables and you just so you're climb looking, away. you're looking for the the big spender that's probably not that good at playing poker, but they don't mind because they've just got the money to just yeah. Push. They're well, just doing it for fun, right? It's but not you even know that much money. Play, yeah. So you're like, well, this is the fish that I need to correct take yeah. the money off, right? It's because you're taking money off each other in poker. So yeah. you, you want to so be sitting there. You you kind of make your allies too. You have a couple of guys who are good on the table. You know, you make a few allies. Yeah. So that they're not gonna when they got you for you know they're going to take a thousand bucks off yeah. you yeah. you know you know that they're going to be a bit gentle you know they'll put yeah. some lube on it because yeah because <laughs> yeah. yeah. poker's poker's not like playing roulette right you're not like you're chucking money down the drain if you know how to play it properly there's a system around it right? yeah like you know it, like if you sat on a poker table with somebody who knows how to play poker yeah you're gonna like lose. nine out of ten times you're gonna lose yeah. the only one time you win is if you're lucky yeah but that's in a tournament style if you sat in a cash game which means that it doesn't stop it's yeah. forever going. Just keep going. 
I think 100% of the time you're going to lose. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you sit long enough with that one person. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you can you can actually make a lot of money, but it takes a lot out of you mentally. Mm. Like it's actually very draining because you're literally calculating All non-stop. Time, Imagine yeah. sitting for 12 Maps. hours, you know, seven days. You can do it for certain, some people can do it forever, but, yeah. you know, I tried to play mm-hmm. last week for the first time in years and I was getting bored like, <laughs> after like two hours. I was only playing for $50 buy-in or something. Yeah, so it yeah. was like, you know, $1,000 cash prize pool or something. I was just like, I started getting really aggressive and yeah, I was yeah. just like, I can get, these, bored, I can yeah. get these chumps. <laughs> you know, I just, but I was winning every hand, like I was winning percentage wise every hand, but yeah. the cards just didn't go my way. You yeah, know? So okay, I was yeah. just like, yeah, I was always like, I always try to win at like a 60% plus ratio. I know I'm, I'm yeah. ahead, you know, with a decent amount, yeah. but a decent percentage that my odds are going to beat them. I used, to, I used to play at home with my mates. We'd all do like, I don't know, 20 quid buy-ins or whatever it was with, you know, and I would, I would lose every single time. Yeah, every yeah. single time. There's always one bloke every night. Like I just, we're gonna stop playing poker now because this this guy Jack just always. Yeah, yeah. It's Like every single time we play. He's together. probably he's probably good at it too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So and the like, drunker you get yeah. as well, like you've had a few drinks and then you get a bit more boisterous with you know right. bullish with everything and you're like and you just you know going all in on silly hands and yeah. stuff like that. But it's a fun game. Like <clears> but, uh, yeah. I still I still like like it. I'm hosting a night in a couple of weeks. You know, so I'm like yeah, cool. you know I should yeah. I don't even need a brush up. It's like riding a bike. I'll jump in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't think the guys really know how to play, but I actually probably have to pretend to lose because a couple of them are local agents, you know, I have to say, <laughs> you know, I want them to, you know, go, hey, look, there's a good broker in the area. Not that, oh, this broker, he takes my money all the time. Yeah, you know, exactly. So you got to let just have win. to let him win a few hands, <laughs> give him a bit of ego Strategy. back. That's where the strategic comes I, I hope you guys aren't listening. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. switch off from now. Yeah. Um, so obviously you're, you're saving and you're building, but you're not, 100 percent sure mm. where you're going to put this money or where you're going to go next in whatever direction you're going to go in. Yeah. Where did you end up? Where did you end up falling into? Or so up- during that period, I guess I could see. I guess the fall of the poker. Poker was huge back in 2013. Yep. You know those kind of years. Um, Joe Hashin won the World Series, so this thing just blew up, and these franchises have gone crazy. And then we're kind of going backwards now. Like I could just see our our money just our profits are just away, dwindling yeah. away. Yeah, yeah. Um, and my passion for it was dwindling. Like I didn't enjoy going to the tournaments no more. The, the clientele. So a lot of late nights, I imagine. Oh man, well. I'd come out at four in the morning, five in the morning. I was yeah. I kind of I, I was Something. getting older, and I started like wanting to, like yeah. I, I'm a morning person. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it didn't make sense for me to work be working all night all the time. And I wasn't as much at the games anymore. I was probably doing three or four shifts a week now mm. versus 16 shifts or whatever it was I was doing some crazy stuff mm. um, and the staff were running a lot of it but the, like I needed to do something else this was never going to make me kind of the riches or you know the wealth that I want to be you know like or yeah. be at anyway so I've always had this vision of you know being very successful and you know having lots of homes and kind mm-hmm. of living I guess a care well, let's say carefree but not having money as one of the kind of things inhibiting me stressor. yeah to yeah. enjoy yeah. you know I like I like Traveling, or like you know, eating nice food, experiencing different things. So nice cars. it wasn't got yeah, nice cars was always <laughs> the, the, the number one thing for me. Um, but I couldn't have all of this with you know what I was doing. I just yeah. didn't see the future in it. So I was just yeah. trying to find something, anything. Yeah. And then one morning, because I was working night shifts, and you know you, you kind of veg out in the morning. I was watching. I think it was the morning show, and a and a bloke popped on there, and he's like you can be a mortgage broker. <laughs> it's kind of like that sign when, you know, the first sign when I ran the poker tournaments is like, you know, we want you. This one's like, you can be a mortgage broker. Yeah. Meet Tom and Daisy. Yeah. They were plumbers and they are now yeah. mortgage brokers. You know? So, yeah. <laughs> That's like the uh, lawn mowing guy where he's like, you can be. Yeah, yeah Jim, Jim's what, mowing. Jim's yeah, mowing yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty much make, Jim's you know, mowing guy in the morning yeah, yeah, show. Yeah. That's what happened. This bloke came on <laughs> and I remember meeting him at, um, in, oh, I can't remember, it was like Hyde Park, the hotel, that's the High you know, Park Hotel. No, I know it's called Hyde Park. This Shang- Sheraton, Shangri La. Oh, no, it's not Shangri La. That's bloody Sheraton. Sheraton. Okay. It's probably the Sheraton. Sheraton on the park. Maybe I yeah, it's Sheraton yeah. on the park. There you go. They had like a VIP <laughs> area where if you have to club membership, brought me up there, mm. and you got this like really attractive girl to come out, and you know I was a young, of course he did. That young single wonders. male, <laughs> and she just kept like moving her legs and we'll having this conversation. I'm like, what is going on? It, felt, it, it really felt cheesy, you know. Like, but in my gut, like I should listen. To my gut, my gut was saying, don't do it. Yeah, don't do it. This look, this is sending me somewhere bad but I had no other options I was desperate I was looking for a business then went to franchise expos went yeah. to everything I was trying to find something that was calling my name you know because yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew I was mathematically in tune I was on the like I was very good at mathematics mm. pretty much scored 100% of my maths test yeah. in the HSC like I was always um very 
I guess I didn't make errors when it comes to mathematical yeah. numbers. So numbers so, was like a, it was an easy thing. For yeah, you, correct. It was a natural thing. That's why mm. poker became natural, you know, yeah. kind of between poker and, you know, doing, I guess, my own numbers of finance, saving yeah. money, yeah. knowing my own calcs all the time. It was very mm. easy for me. So the natural, that's why I done accounting because I thought that's what I wanted to be. When I actually saw mm. what accountants done, I'm like, this is shit. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> yeah. No offense to accountants out there, but like, I was not for me, you know? Not for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. I'm not introverted you know it's not not that you have to be introverted to be accountant but there's you know there's a big element of that because yes, you actually indeed. need to be sitting there and mm -hmm. actually crunching numbers every day yeah um, so yeah it wasn't for me and this was calling for me and then i started seeing what mortgage brokers done they explained to me the commission model they explained to me you know how you can make and make a living by helping people yeah i was like this is great because yeah it's perfect yeah, i couldn't do anything like in my life i could never do something that's gonna be directly not giving people benefit of some yeah. sort you know if yeah, that's yeah. the right, right way to say it i think that's just, I, I had a similar thing right so obviously um those that know my background i joined the marines because i thought oh well this this is a challenge for me selfishly but i'm also helping mm -hmm. in, in a way yeah and then i went into doing personal training afterwards but you know yeah it's going to make me money and i get commission and you know mm. paid good good and out, hourly rate but it, it it sort of tickles my entrepreneurial side and also the fact that i'm helping people as well yeah 100%. and then actually when i when i came to australia and we we met at your yeah. new year's, new year's <laughs> Eve Eve <laughs> i was like i was like mortgage brokering this tickles my fact like because i'm interested in property yeah. personally but also understanding the model of how mortgage brokers work. That's just exactly how my brain wants to operate. Yeah, 100%. I like, the, I like the commission structure. I like the fact that I'm also helping people as well. Like you're, you're, kind, of, you're kind of knocking both things on the head yeah. at the same time. Yeah, it, it, uh, you're a perfect suit for it as well. And mm. then, you know, watching you come up now and you know, do what you're doing now is great. Um, yes, yeah, like that, that's what drew me as well, you yeah. know, the, the same yeah, element yeah. of, you know, you have to have that personality that you you know, <coughs> you genuinely want to help because the ones that succeed in this industry, the ones that actually really care about people, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, they're good with numbers, they're good with people, they understand, you know, like how to get a deal done, but, you know, they understand also like what people truly can afford, household yeah. budgets, um, you yeah. know, that they're not going to go under. I think our mortgage business, I, I don't think there's anyone who's ever like actually defaulted in a sense because we've always addressed all these things up yeah. front so <coughs> like fully defaulted on a mortgage i've never had a sale forced on a yeah, customer yeah, yeah. so yeah. had people miss payments and all but yeah. nothing crazy yeah yeah um so yeah end up with that um uh franchise, franchise. am i allowed to say the franchise or yeah, yeah you can yeah, right of course you can, yeah. it was a group called refund home loans um refund they, refund home loans okay so they would give you a refund of their commission when they mm. do a home loan which you almost know, like a kickback a kickback yeah every yeah. time you know like obviously we don't do that now because i think our time is valuable yeah, and we yeah. need you know we need to you know value our time if you know <clears throat> imagine someone comes to ask you to discount your services that's basically what you're doing yeah you know so uh, but yeah that business i tried to run it i think it was for two years and i probably wrote nine loans in two years with i could write nine loans in less than a week now yeah, but yeah. you know doing nine loans in in two years means i'm definitely not doing not something right yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, i'm not making any money and not doing anything right money, i like spent a lot of time on <laughs> on stuff and i actually look back at those nine deals and i probably would have done it 10 times better if i'd done it today yeah yeah like i was yeah it was it was a different era you would have had a referral process in play and oh you know, just a million loans would have been wrote, written better and the notes a million and different stuff. things even the, the lender selection and stuff like that and just yeah. everything was just yeah. yeah it looked it looked horrible i actually look back at it because one of them was my best mates and I had to move him from the old lender that I put him in years ago. So yeah, actually, yeah. yeah, I looked at it and go, wow, I can't believe... How put, bad I yeah, was. Yeah, how bad <laughs> <laughs> So uh, with that realisation, funny enough, that one of my old poker players, <coughs> he offered me a job, at the, a job at the bank as a business banking manager at Westpac. At Westpac? Yeah, and then I went um, for that role and they rejected me. <laughs> and they, they go, we don't... You have no experience. Like, they know, I know you've been a mortgage broker for two years, but you didn't do anything. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> They're like, you've you actually, nine loans. You actually badly. have no experience. You worked for yourself your whole life. <laughs> you know, you've dropped out of uni. You have no experience. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do now? And mm. then they're like, but I do have a job for you. It's an entry-level job. Cleaning. Yeah, pretty much. Like, you scrub <laughs> the toilets, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, it was, they gave me the job as a personal banker, which is like the entry level personal banker. Yeah, so I was yeah. at the front desk screening people. Yeah. Um, I think they put me at the front desk, and I think if within three months the sales like went up three hundred percent. 
Yeah, so they that's noticed, skills, that, right? yeah, they were like, mm. Jesus Christ, what is this guy doing at the front mm. desk? So then mm. I started like coaching all the existing guys on how to get more sales. Yeah, yeah. And I think the problem with a lot with the banking system is like, it's because it's so big, right? If you could walk to a bank, the guys from the top are telling you something, then they're telling this guy something, the middle management's saying something, then he goes to the branch manager mm-hmm. and then the branch manager gets to the staff. By then you're left with something so diluted. Yeah. It's like, let's make money for the bank. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know, like yeah. let's not think about people's feelings or their families. And, yeah. you know, so I stayed there for, you know, I was in that role for six months when until I got promoted and then six months again, got promoted again and finally landed <laughs> in that role that I wanted in the first place. Which is the beta, yeah. Yeah. And um, I f- the role wasn't what I thought it was going to be, you know? So I was just, I, I felt like I was back in the broken game again. I was just sinking... <coughs> They're throwing all these deals at me that don't make sense. Mm. The bank won't lend. I was in the business banking sector at the time. You were dealing with brokers at that time, or you were doing? No, I was dealing with business, small businesses. Oh, small yeah, businesses. around the area. And the funny thing is, they weren't giving much policy for small businesses to get loans, right? Oh, right. You so just everything qu- that you were getting fired at was just like this is a no. Yeah, everything a no. was a no. And then yeah. so what I decided uh, to make my scorecard, home loans were one of the biggest contributors. So I just started smashing out the home loans. Yeah. Because you weren't facilitating business needs like you know from FPAS to business loans to cash flow lens yeah, yeah. they weren't they were rejecting all of that so I was just writing home loans or like there were two things equipment finance and home loans what you could do that so was it, yeah. I was literally getting people Porsches and helping them buy houses <laughs> <laughs> and I was making my target from that Use. yeah um, yeah so that's that's kind of the journey of how we ended up I ended up becoming a broker um, so and broker then you, and then banker you left, broker you left left Westpac and yeah so that was a broker about, again correct so about yeah. two years in then I was I started like wanting to become a broker really badly again because I felt like I had the network so I had the skills now yeah um, I'm like I'm ready to go again like I've, uh, this is what I want to do you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I couldn't yeah, you know, live off that salary because I I just had a new child and there was a lot lot going on in my life, so <coughs> I was running to make extra money on the side. I was running nightclubs every Friday and Saturday night, so taking a percentage of the door and um you know bringing people into for the tables made a lot of networks there All too. All of this is networking, right? Yeah, so you go from poker, yeah, well school school really with the kids that yeah. you know that are, you know oh the cool kids you know the, the, cool, cool, the kids, cool kids yeah the yeah. cool kids so you're yeah. hanging out with the cool kids. Then you go and do the poker tournaments, which 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 meets both things because you're networking and you're, you know, doing all your math- mathematics and, yeah. and building that business and the entrepreneur side of you. And then I suppose that falls off a bit when you go to Westpac, but but then obviously you get into the nightclubs on the side, yeah. and that kind of brings it back to life again. Yeah, like we had a lot of we failed nightclubs. We ran a lot of things. We even got involved in a New Year's Eve event that got cancelled last minute and lost a lot of money. So, <laughs> and that was that was a yeah maybe that that was a very sad event. Yeah, events. Not yeah, so I answer. got involved in a lot of stuff in nightclubs. You know, I I think I just always followed kind of my soul, but I'm I've been like a vibe and soul person. You know, so yeah. you know I loved I really enjoyed nightclubs. I yeah. still do. Like when I was in IB for a few weeks ago. So, <laughs> it was, um, but so it's like just kind of followed. I know it sounds like follow your passion but I think yeah. I, the only way you do can do what you like right yeah the only way you can follow it but is if you do numbers people forget this yeah, right yeah, yeah. like they want to follow their passion but they have nothing to fall back on they're not yeah. willing to move back with mum and dad yeah, they're yeah, not willing yeah. to do this or willing to do that they're like I got a lifestyle I want fancy things now you know yeah. but they're not willing to wear you know, sacrifice yeah five dollar shirts and sacrifice everything to get to the next level yeah um or even you know i lived with my dad as long as i could but i was fortunate enough to find a friend who had a room and paid a hundred dollars a week you know to live yeah. in his room yeah, i'll yeah. spare room for five years so. well i think a lot of people do that you, we see it all the time now right mm. where you get someone that's like you know want to get a pre-approval or whatever and they're they're living by themselves paying 900 dollars a week in rent and they've got a car on tick and they've got a jet ski on tick yeah got, you know and the, and you're just sitting it's there all like, now now you know like, like oh man you know how i'm gonna get your loan yeah you, know? you gotta yeah. sacrifice a bit to get ahead yeah <clears throat> just hire a jet ski every now and then you know? <laughs> yeah just hire <laughs> to it, be yeah. honest they probably like if they hired it would be cheaper yeah, it'd be cheaper. yeah. <laughs> it's like a boat sometimes yeah. you know, hey um you, you pay for a timeshare and then yeah. you end up like using it once every two yeah, years exactly. uh, or it's yeah. like getting a track day yeah you know you get the track day you know if you can't afford the car don't get it you yeah know nah. like, but oh, you know mate. seen some horror stories by yeah, <laughs> the track, yeah, yeah. but yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that um going back to i guess um yeah so when i was at the bank i one of my customers walked in and uh her name's ernie she 
she was a lovely customer. Ernie. Yeah. Oh, Ernie, there you Ernie go. was Ernie was one of my customers. Um, she's first time meeting me. I was, I was trying to know my portfolio, so I was calling everyone in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was calling every broker I knew, all the top hundred brokers who I was looking after, just to help mm. them in the in the bank for their own personal banking. Yeah. And I'm like, would you take me on? Would you take me on? Nobody wanted to take me on. And it just so happened that um, Ernie walked into the branch, and she was like, oh. Uh, she just asked me a lot of questions and then she must have went back to her husband Dave at the time and then Dave was like they were looking for a broker and so they called me in to talk to me about becoming a broker so that's how it all kind of started unfolding I'm like, oh, there you I'm like go. wow okay I'm like you know we set up a structure where I, I was happy to come in um, commission only um, you know they were looking for a commission only broker I was happy yeah. to go commission only yeah. we came to an agreement I came into the business for 12 months um, and we for some reason, the chemistry worked really, really well. You did more than nine deals that year. Oh yeah, we, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think I think in my first year we done I done like sixty four million or something like that, which was yeah, yeah. pretty incredible good, yeah. for a first year of broking. <clears throat> which you know, um, and that kind of formed after twelve months. I was a contractor to their business, um, and that was part of Yellow Brick Road in Randwick. So yeah. after the twelve months, um, you know, we ended up deciding to become business partners, and I bought in for fifty percent of the business, and we became partners from there. Um, nice. Went on, stayed with the, the franchise for five years, which is still we still operate actually as a you know we've got a sub license with them, we still do some deals for them. Yeah. Um, but after that five years, we started up obviously strategic brokers, and yeah. um, well, I started. So Dave and I had a split. Yeah, we broke up for some time. Yeah. Um, and, and then, then you, and then we, we realised we're better together. And then yeah, we, yeah. you know, now I started to trade strategic brokers, and Dave has only just rejoined the business recently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we've got a bit of a, a fair bit of history between the start and the finish of where oh, we that's are crazy. now. Crazy, I didn't know yeah, that. You I didn't know, know the story. story. No, no, yeah. no. There you go. So that's the original story. Yeah. yeah. So now, obviously, the brokerage is doing really well. Mm. What What else are you doing now? Because <clears throat> obviously, the business is doing its thing, right? Yeah. And, and obviously, you're one of the hardest workers in the room, which is great. Um, from a leadership perspective, but the um, where else are you moving things, diversifying? Yeah, like I like I always <clears throat> love property, right? So property yeah. has always been the biggest thing. I've got a dabble in, dabbled in crypto. I watched my crypto go from watch like, that go down. I, I watched <laughs> it go up like a rocket ship. Everyone watched it, and go then up. I watched it come back to go, reality. Yeah. Literally yeah. break even. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think somebody said to me once, "Is like." Not that I don't believe in it or I, I don't understand it. Yeah. I, like I think I, do what you know, right? Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. I don't understand crypto, but I have money in there because what the what if? What if, yeah, the what if, what yeah. if it does what it did and it did? You know, I don't yeah. want the stupid moves. That's moves. more of a punt though, isn't it? It the is a punt, like, but you're not going to put your whole... You're not going to put everything or, You're not going to put all your like eggs in one bit. basket. There is, yeah. you know, property, I put all of my eggs in that basket and, and not be afraid at all every day of the week to leverage to buy more property. Every time you can give me an, an inch of borrowing power, I take it. Take it, yeah. yeah. There's, I pretty much, I don't think I ever have borrowing power. Ever, yeah. <laughs> Every time I do a tax At return. At the absolute maximum. I'm like, yes, I can buy something. <laughs> so I'll just buy. <laughs> and I'll find something to buy regardless. And I'll just look at, you know, well, I guess it's like knowledge is the key. So the more you understand about, you know, the fundamentals yeah. of property or, you know, every single, like you're never afraid. It's one of those things where, yeah. and the backbone of the Australian economy is property. Right? And, and, the, and the crazy thing about Australia is that a tax return and a, and a property investment is like a sport over here, right? Oh, absolutely. I've never seen anything like it. We've got I the thought the UK for... was passionate about property and then I got to Australia no. and I was like, fuck, everyone's in property, that, everyone. That's where the game is and like the history, <coughs> I guess, repeats itself. You know, mm. we, have, we, we have peaks, we have, you know, corrections, yeah. as we say it. You know, you hear about the catastrophes with people losing you know, shitloads of money in mining towns and stuff like that. That's just because they they bought in speculation. Mm. That's just like buying crypto. You know, no difference there compared to, you know, buying in mining towns and the rest of it, right? You're just buying with a boom and bust. Yeah. Uh, you stay to the core fundamentals like everyone talks about, you know, main cities, you know, um, landlocked areas yeah. where you can't actually keep building, you know. Like, There's key rules, right, yeah. around it. Uh, we stick to that. So yeah, we. I've, I think I've always diversified in property. We kept buying. Mm. Um, nowadays, a bit more into the development space where we can kind of start cutting up land for people. We're back. Sorry, guys. A um, bit of a lighting issue. Sort of uh, the sun was sort of coming across my eye there. No, um, the, the truth <laughs> is we just wanted another beer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we got back. another one in. We're back. <laughs> um, 
right let's let's just take this back a step because we were talking about your developments and 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 property journey but let's go back to that first purchase yeah and how the portfolio and how you got to developments now the journey i'm i'm also i guess passionate about property my all i wanted to do was buy property once i started understanding i guess the property game the finance game um and when i was working in westpac the very first i bought a property off the plan which was a house uh in the western suburbs of mine and i i bought it to live in it you know yeah um little did i know that as I bought it and I was about to move into it, I um I knocked up a girl and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know after nine months of dating and uh, you know the rest is history after that. But mate, that is so similar to me with my missus because uh, <laughs> she literally moved to the UK and then I and then she got knocked up. Uh, she moved out in the mar- March. And then got knocked up in yeah. November just before COVID. That's why we get along so well, you know. <laughs> we, we got that knocking up girls. No? <laughs> so yeah, now um, I think it was two thousand, the year two thousand twelve, yeah. and the interest rates were around six percent, kind of what they are today. Well, they are now, yeah. Yeah, and then I remember heading into two thousand thirteen uh, when I was working at Westpac, they announced a rate of four point nine nine fixed, which was like, r- like whoa, whoa, we yeah. haven't seen four point nine nine for like a long long time I don't know how long it was but yeah. that was the beginning of the property the big boom you know we had a good run between after the GFC there was the correction in 2008 yeah. people think the GFC was like the worst you know it was a good opportunity it, if you knew a great opportunity and the market only corrected somewhat <laughs> like less than 10% right like it yeah. wasn't like a it fell off a cliff yeah. and you know how fast it took to recover it was only a few months after that and the market started yeah, yeah, gaining yeah. momentum yeah. again to pick itself back up to pre-GFC I think, levels I think this is where um, people just read into the media headlines a mm. bit too much. It's like recently with the interest rates going through the roof, right? But the market's still moving strong. Oh, mate, like, people forget, man. Like property itself in Australia. Yeah, you got to live somewhere and people do anything to pay their mortgage. <clears throat> Probably the second key fact is I think it's one third of properties are unencumbered here in Australia. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're unencumbered. Paid. There's no debt. Mm-hmm. And then I think one third, I'm not sure about these exact stats, but I, always, I hear it, you know, at seminar after seminar and, you know, podcast of the podcast is that, you know, the other third only have a minimal amount of debt. And some people actually don't really have debt. They've actually got a loan, but with they're fully offset, yeah, you know. Loan, yeah. And then the other third are, are the battlers. Everyone's just battling, you know. So that's yeah. the ones that are, are scared. But, you know, the truth is there's... They're going to do everything in their they're power. They're going to do everything, yeah. Paying. Correct. So. Yeah. <coughs> Oop. Oop, there we go. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, so that, like, you know, that in itself, you know, explains why our market continues to run strong and especially mm. with the good fundamentals you know places where people actually want to live and p- places that people can raise a family the most attractive right yeah because uh, you know the great australian dream is to own a home and that's the thing so like going 2013 bought that first one off the plan i was very fortunate i bought a house not a unit not a you know yeah. um in that house i think i, I paid four hundred and fifteen thousand off the cuff for it yeah uh, w- when i got it revalued at settlement it was at 560 or something like that and that was before i even you know, put a dollar into the mortgage. Put a dollar into yeah. it, yeah. Not saying that buying off the plan is a great thing or anything like that. It's just I was fortunate enough to have bought you got lucky at a good time. One. Yeah, I got yeah, lucky. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know what yeah, didn't know what the yeah, hell yeah, I was yeah. doing. You got lucky on that one. I got absolutely lucky. <coughs> you know, I had equity from day one. I was allowed to borrow ninety percent because I was a bank employee. I uh, settled that before obviously went into brokerage. But mm-hmm. since I settled, I had ability to have equity. And then I done the, the the worst thing in the world that I could possibly do to myself is I then I ended up drawing equity from that property and yeah. buying two off the plan properties because oh, I thought off the plan was this is the shit. Yeah. You know, like you got lucky I once. could put a little bit of money down, yeah, yeah, settle yeah. in a few years, yeah. and make some money, and then you know I'll be great. I think I went to some phony seminars and I'll say phony like just a bunch of you know spookers yeah. selling stuff. So I ended up buying them. two different off the plan <clears> properties, <throat> um, and actually one of them one of them done really well. Uh, not really well, but done. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 One, one, one didn't done. lose money or like done, yeah. It, it, it didn't cause or, me any issues. Yeah, That's yeah, what yeah. really well okay. means. But the other one, I actually, if I valued the property today, it's I've I, I exchanged it in 2013 uh, or 2014 around then, and um, I revalued it last week, and it's worth pretty much exactly what Just I paid same. for it. <laughs> <laughs> the house that I bought back then it's worth three times the amount i paid for it now yeah. you know so like yeah, yeah, you yeah. put in comparison you know when you buy a good asset versus a shit asset around the same time yeah. it's such a big difference and i've still got that property um and then along the way obviously i learned and i started then buying more and more properties that were good properties houses attractive to the families 
you know, that are easily rented out. And what guess what happens? The equity goes up, the rents go up, equity goes up, rent co- goes up. Interest rates just do what they do, flop, you know, float. Fluctuate. Yeah, or we've kind of had a fortunate environment where it's kind of hasn't been high at all. Uh, and now we're in the higher times. But guess what? With the higher interest rates, rents are going up. The, you yeah. know, rental market's crazy at the moment. Yeah, because the vacancy rate's so low, right? Correct, yeah. <coughs> they ended up um, yeah getting a little bit into commercial properties. So I bought a couple of them as well. Um, and then, you know, I started delving into property development early as well and just chipping in with other developers. Uh, yeah. One developer recently announced his bankruptcy, which we invested money in 10 years ago. So great, I lost that money, but it was a learning curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all learning. Yeah, so like, you know, we've, we've made a heaps of, I've made so many mistakes in property. I think I've got a pretty sound knowledge of what works and What's what doesn't What's the right work. thing to do now, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> um, and uh, like a hand on heart could, you know, we, we shared out with our customers our journey and show them, you know, all the stuff that, just to think about, not giving the advice, but like um, a prime example was one of our customers, um, they came, or well, one of my customers, a good friend of mine came to me and goes, I wanna buy, you know, buy a property in Rhodes uh, to, to live in, you know, I'm like, why? You know, my question was, why? Why do you wanna buy that? They go, oh, I don't know, parents always said, you gotta own what you live in, right? And mm-hmm. like, okay, but what are you trying to achieve? What do you like, wanna do, yeah, what's your goal? Yeah. What's your goal? And they're like, we, well, we want a house where we can have our dog, you know, stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, well, where, where do you want to live? And they're like, I want to live, you know, I want to live here. I'm like, well, that's $2 million, that's, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's and not like, yeah, roads, we, is it? Yeah, I'm like, well, we can't afford that. And so why are you buying in roads? They're like, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're not sure. We've so, just been told that we should. Yeah, we should. <laughs> so I, I, I then mm. talk to them about like, you know, what else can you do, you, you know? And I'm a firm believer to buy houses in good areas wherever you can. Um, and, and not necessarily areas where you live, right? No, nah, it does stay. Right, they buying. They ended up buying like not off my advice, but off the the back end of you know other people who you know that, that specialise in it. The experts. In it, yeah. They ended up buying you know um, free houses in Queensland three or four years back, uh, in in coastal areas, um, and they ended up you know making one point five million dollars. You know, if I revalued, I revalued their properties recently about one point five million up from where they were. Where they were, yeah. yeah. And if I if I would have revalued that unit in Rhodes, I guess what they'd probably be. Exactly, exactly the same. The same as what they paid for it mm. in that time. So you know, it's wonderful taking people on those journeys. Well, I think it's our job to, um, uh, when you're having a conversation with a customer, is to make sure that they're they're aligned with their own story. Like they're they're telling you what they want, but are you sure? Yeah, like yeah. It's our job to put the like put the questions in there and be like, is this definitely the road that you want to go down? Yeah. Like, you should, do you have you got a reason behind this? Have you got a strategy? Because the amount of conversations I'll have where someone says to me, oh, this is this is what I want to do and I want to, want to get on that. Well, what's your, what's your long-term vision? Yeah. You know, not what, not what, oh, okay, yeah, I just want to get on the ladder for the sake of, you know, first-time buyer scheme and save on some stamp duty and I feel like I should. But what what's the, yeah, what's no, the strategy? You've, 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 got to, you've got to just get people thinking, I guess, and look yeah. at their options. So I've, like my big, my biggest, I guess, money maker in property was actually my own occupiers. So mm. first one being own occupier in that off the plan that I lived in for yeah. like six months or whatever it was, <coughs> you know, mm-hmm. just after six months um, and rented it out, um, you know, bought off the plan. It was already profitable from day one. And when I rented it out, it was profitable from day one. What yeah. a great, what a great series yeah, of events, good. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Caused me to buy then one shitty off the plan and one, <laughs> one okay off the plan, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I had my own occupier, the first one I was living in, like a, uh, anyone who's from Sydney knows uh, Freshwater, one of the best suburbs in Australia. Yep. A little bit biased here, but you know anyone who's- It's a b- pretty good suburb. It's, it's a pretty good suburb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the best suburbs in, in yeah. the country, yeah, I, yeah, I dare yeah. say. 100%. Yeah. Um, I was l- fortunate enough that the girl I knocked up, her family was from Freshwater. So we moved got to, to live, we moved to Freshwater to raise a child. Um, living in Freshwater made me want to then, I actually knew nothing about Freshwater before moving there. I was a Western Suburbs boy, you know, backyard mm. barbecue, you know, drinks, yeah, yeah, yeah. get everyone to have shots and get plastered every weekend. Yeah. Um, but once I moved to that side, like my eyes opened up to a whole another, another world yeah, that yeah. I really started to appreciate and I really wanted to own a home there. Yeah. So I did everything in my power, worked, you know, seven days a week, 16 hours a day, just saving that deposit up to, you know, to try to get to that house. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I really, you know, and obviously kept, investing and making more money in equity every time i had borrowing power like i said i keep borrowing money to buy more property so yeah, yeah, yeah. didn't stop that process to keep yeah. building wealth <clears throat> gave you know the more wealth you create the more opportunity you create right so that kind of went down this whole thing we got married so the girl knocked up we eventually obviously got married <laughs> we yeah, had yeah, yeah. we had our daughter and you know we we um yeah ended up having another child but shout out to cheryl yeah okay. shout out to you cheryl <laughs> <laughs> we um we 
kept losing auctions. So mm. I was trying to buy houses around the area. I kept losing auctions. I wanted to buy a block of land and build on it. Um, and then one day, I think, and then what happened was, I think it was in 2014, we had this like just stint in the property market. And you know those dips we were talking about? Yeah. So we had a dip in the market in 2014. And um, I think that was the beginning of the Royal Commission. I'm trying to remember if that was the year. But there was lending changes in that year. Yeah. And that, that's what caused the market to dip about, you know, five, ten percent, depending on which area you're in. Um, and that was after it was it was rising. I was losing the auctions, and then this stint came, and I had caught up about this house, and they're like, "We want, you know." I was like, "Oh, how much do you want for the house?" They're like, "Oh, you know, the house down the road sold for two point four million." You know, I'm like, "Oh, it's a bit high." I think my budget was like one point eight max. You know, yeah. so I was sitting around that mark, and then what happened was. I was walking my dog Oreo, a French bulldog, yeah. and and weirdly enough, he led me down a different road, which was uh, and there's this house. Never been down there before. Uh, I'm always down there, but I never thought to never, walk. Yeah, 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 I didn't yeah. think to walk the dog down there because you got to yeah. walk up and down hills. Annoying, you know. Yeah, yeah. And the dog doesn't make it up the hill. I have to carry him. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what French Lazy bulldog? Lazy French, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I had to um, made it past this house and went to the open. There was an agent there, and he was just like. He looked super excited to see me. You know, thought I was a Chinese buyer. I was like, yes. Yeah, yeah. Got my Little foreign Chinese know. buyer. <laughs> <laughs> Born in refugee <Cash>. camp. <laughs> <laughs> so we went, I went in and then I looked at the house like, hey, I'm like, I, I thought it was out of my budget. It was a brand new home. You know, it was a kit home built by Metricon or something like that. You know, it wasn't like, yeah. you know, it wasn't all the bells and whistles, but it was perfect for one. It had a swimming pool close to the beach. Yeah. Like, you know, it was on the main road. I didn't care, you know, like, yeah. but it had everything I needed at that, like, you know, but. At that time, yeah. 1.8 was my budget. So I was like, oh, you know, how much you want for it? He goes, oh, look, the owner will take 195. I'm like, 195? I'm like, shit, I'm going to find 150 grand somewhere. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like, look, let's try to bargain the guy. Put him at 17. I go, oh, I've got 17. I can, that's probably my maximum. I can, I can probably bid today. And then we started getting into negotiations. Somehow landed at 1.82. And so 20 grand above. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah what did you have to sell? I didn't have to sell anything. <laughs> <laughs> a little, little, yeah, so a little limb. <laughs> you can't see my missing leg now. <laughs> but yeah, it was, um, it ended up just like the stars aligned for that property. You know, accidentally yeah, yeah. bought that home. Yeah. It, Sometimes I, actually, it works out like that, you know? Absolute accident, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we lived in that for, from 2014, the end of the year, so call it 2015 till, um, until last year. Um, when, what happened was, so, we lived in it and, and that market just kept got running after that. You yeah, know? fresh water the, that area the, is just I think the suburb right? average is four million now, you know, so you kind of you can <clears throat> get the gist from like a growth, growth two thousand fifteen, yeah. eight years yeah. to go up more than double in, in an area. You, it's a, one of the best areas in Australia to live in. And it's yeah. proven there's a lot of guys who live down the road, which every hundred meters you go down, you go up a couple of million until you get yeah, to the beach do, side yeah. where you have twenty million yeah, 20, plus. Yeah. yeah. So it's such a beautiful suburb. But um yeah, like I was there and I think the, I think I, I was telling you about it before how I accidentally paid off my house, right? Like, yeah. I ended up selling that property, um, but before I sold it, what happened was I was getting into property development. I was like, you know what? I'm sick of these guys throwing money with them. They're not doing their job right. I'm like, I'm just going to do one myself. Um, so when COVID hit, it left room for opportunity. And I saw this site in, in Chroma DY, yeah. which is not too far from where we are. And it was, it's so much cheaper in Chroma DY than it is in Freshwater, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I saw a site for sale and they were desperate to sell because they were developers and COVID hit and they were, they were shitting bricks and, you know, put up a number that was stupid. I bought a site for way under market. Yeah. Um, it was almost 900 square meters. You know, I was going to build a duplex on it. Um, and then obviously we came out of COVID and recovered and guess what? The property market did what it did, Cor corrected, corrected itself, and they up again. shot out the roof. Uh, so yeah, over a year and a bit ago, or two, I think it was two years ago now, when the market was starting to hit its peak, um, I saw interest rates at you know 1.89 fix, 1.79 even at one point. Mm. Um, and I go, this is the peak. You yeah, can't yeah, get yeah. rates any cheaper than this. You yeah. can't, you know, possibly be, you know, if I want to cash in now, there's a number, of, you know. This is where this if is where I get this number, it, yeah. I could. Well, what I saw was if I get this number, I could build on that development site yep. any house I want to build, and I could walk away with no debt. No debt. And yeah. I'd be I'd be in my early to mid thirties, um, and I'd have no mortgage. And if I revalued that house, it'd probably be worth five million plus. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I accidentally. Well, I put that number out to one of the agents there, one very good agent in the area, and I go, if you can get me this number, then you know I'll sell. 
Yeah. And guess what? We took it out. We put he put like twenty of the underbidders on other properties through the property for just literally one Saturday. It was sold on Monday, <sighs> and it was a, sold for about two hundred grand more than what my number was. Whoa. So it was. So it this was, is the one in, that you were living in in freshwater. freshwater. Yeah. So and how much above? Like you bought it for what? I bought it for one eight. And what did you sell it for? Oh, I was in the freeze. So it's yeah. In the freeze. Yeah, yeah. So you you've cleared like <clears throat> one point X mil, whatever. Mm. And you've paid down your loan by then as well. Yeah, I correct. Imagine, and a bit, so you got. And I paid <clears throat> only a very small amount for the the land that I bought in, during COVID. And then basically you've got the money to develop this. Yeah. So awesome property, the Taj Mahal. Yeah. As we call it. The, we call it the Taj Mahal of Chroma now. I don't know if Ross wants to show a snippet of it, but I'm pretty yeah. open to. We'll show the photo. We'll show you a couple of photos of the house, but like we created this Shout beautiful house. Shout out to Ascon Group. Ascon <laughs> yeah. Group, yeah. Shout out to Ascon and Paul. <laughs> but yeah, he did build me a beautiful home. Uh, yeah. But yeah, like I accidentally. What can you call it? Accidentally paid off my house. So yeah, well, you you, um, oh, you can say that it's luck, but you've 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 put yourself in that position to you know give yourself an opportunity, right? And yeah, it just correct. so happened that you know you waited and the timing was right, and you know the you know you've fa- like you've done yeah. so many things that you tried before didn't quite work out. You know, and then yeah. you learn you learn along the way and these things these things are doing. A really lot of well people probably options. you gotta get less you, risk oriented. You gotta make your me. luck, right? You gotta yeah. you know. I think I've I've made a lot of mistakes and I'm at a kind of <laughs> time now I think I've made the mistakes and I don't need to make the mistakes, but I'm pretty smart about things and guess what? We're going to jump in crazier and bigger deals <laughs> and we're and I'm not afraid. Like, you know, we just yeah. we just picked up a, a massive site, uh, that's seven thousand three hundred square meters and now uh, we're in Sydney and we're you know, we're building I think it's a total of 16 houses on that. Um, we're going to market for with the first six. With yourself or with a group? Uh, there's, there's three partners involved in that. So yeah. that's something that we're doing. Oh, so that's cool. something that we're doing now, yeah. uh, which is very exciting. So, cool. you know, nice. um, yeah, you live and you learn. And, you know, I, I live, live in a pretty good life now. Very happy with everything that's been going on. So is that the, um, is that the, f- where do you, where do you see like the next 10 years for you? Like, where do you, where do you see, are, are you just sort of taking it year by year? And yeah. I when think so. the opportunities come, you're just going to. I think so. You- I've always been a vibe person. So <clears throat> my gut kind of. Your gut saying yes. Saying yes. And every time I didn't follow my gut, it's led me somewhere bad, but mm. somewhere bad, it wasn't always necessarily bad. It always kind of. A learning curve. Yeah. A learning <clears throat> curve, you know, <clears throat> but I think I'm, I'm much more mature now. I don't want to make those mistakes anymore. I don't need to, you know, yeah. like a lot of time where, you know, the house is done. You know, got a lot of investment properties, which are now the rents because of the interest rate rises, the rents are now profiting me. Uh, so I'm getting, making passive income off them. Um, business is going really well. So if I just keep continuing on this path without making mistakes, I guess life will be pretty good, right? Yeah. You know, so so the, let, let's just, just sort of recap, wrap things up a bit. I just want you to, you know, all, all of this, all of this stuff that you've learned over the years going to from the nightclubs to the poker mm. to the starting up the successful brokerage after failing the first time then going to work to a bank and then going back and you know meeting up with Ernie and Dave and yeah. now you've got strategic brokers and that now you're on to developments and other things where what's your advice for people that are you when you're 18 years old to the age of maybe oh, 23 man. 24 and you're sitting there and you're like, I'm just not sure where to... I, I, I can 100% tell you, that, like hand on heart, that you need to find your A-team. Like you need to find the people you can trust. Yeah. And that's very hard. You know what I mean? Like who do you trust? Yeah. You know? Nowadays, like it's, it's pretty good nowadays because we've got podcasts, we've got things, you know, you can mm-hmm. really latch on to. And if you listen to people's content for long enough, you almost know them, right? Mm-hmm. And you get to understand, you know, if they're trustworthy, if they actually got your best intention in mind. Uh, really important things, you know, and they're not just running a business for money or for greed or whatever it is. You want to make sure that they genuinely care. And yeah. I can, like, you know, we hand on heart genuinely care. It's yeah. not that, you know, we do things like just for the sake of our own benefit. We want to see people grow with us, you know, yeah, that's the yeah, most yeah, exciting yeah. part of our job. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that's, you know, the 18, whether it's your broker, your accountant, like financially 18, right? Yeah. Because they're going to guide you. A lot of these mistakes I made, I could tell you, if I had someone I could trust to look for a mentor mm. or somebody I could look up to and say, hey, what do you think of this? And they've been through all of this crap that I've been through. Yeah. They list- you don't need to redo it yourself. No, you right? don't need you, to. You just learn I've done the crap. people's yeah. mistakes. Yeah, and yeah, I was, yeah. It's not everyone's yeah. got the f- a thick enough backbone to say, hey, I'm going to pick myself up and get and do, do it, it again, again yeah, you yeah. know and that's what I was like I had a conversation today I'm like man if we didn't buy that property because they came to me to buy a 
a service department or something like that and they ended up buying a property uh, through Simon actually who's been on your podcast yep. and we have revowed the property last week and the property you know, from the last eight months has gone up maybe you know 100 grand right which is you know, it might That's not sound it is like it is a lot of money, money over it's eight months it's a year's salary right for correct a, you know? well the property I told him I actually done it today it was funny I was like we should value that property you're looking at. I got the email chain, mm. and I'm like, guess what? That property would be lo- worth, worth probably seventy grand less than what you would have paid for it if yeah, had you yeah. bought it because it was running in the peak of COVID when everyone was trying to get into and coastal it's trials. Dropped. It's yeah. dropped because yeah, yeah. it was yeah, it was like Port Stevens, you know, it was one yeah. of those holiday rentals. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, this is a bad bad investment, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And sure enough, it did exactly what we thought it was going to do. And even moving forward, it might go up eventually, but like based on the strata, the holiday letting. Yeah. If you've got the A team around you, right, the strategy yeah. is that you're going to make money from the get go, not make oh, it down the line because you've held onto it for five, ten years. You fast forward, <coughs> fast forward, massive. Yeah. It's it's like a cheat code. Yeah. You know, imagine playing yeah, yeah. you know Mario Brothers where you can have twenty lives. You I know? think people as well like um, yeah. I think some people think that they can't have the conversation until they think they're ready to go. Yes, as well. yes. Like, like, that's, like, that's, um, that is terrible like, mentality. I always say to I always say to people like, um, obviously I've got like you know my my poms on the property ladder group and and, mm. and people that we speak to and they're, and they're like oh you know I'll talk to you in six months. I'm like no, let's have a phone call now. Yeah. Because we can strategize it now for six months time when you might have you might be ready in three months or four some months some people or, are ready now they, don't know. they just don't even know yeah. yeah they don't know that they can get a family guarantee or they yeah. don't know that they can you know they've got enough money to pay for the deposit now or whatever it is so I think for a lot of people like you say get an A team around you mm. speak to the right people that have the right network um, and have the conversation not when you think you're ready just have it so yeah. you've got the knowledge, right? Then you know, oh, this is my current position. I need, I'm going to be ready in four months or six months or 12 months or two years or whatever, you know, even if you're 19 years old, pick up the phone, call these people so you've got a goal and a strategy yeah. ahead of time, you know? 100%, 100%. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, Th- mate. Cheers, for, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're going to wrap it up there. Like and subscribe and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks again.